welcome, welcome, welcome to the Art of Advocacy. I'm your host, Dr. Sheldon L. Akins, and I am really excited today. As always, I'm going to highlight the book. It's out! Before I was saying pre-order, but now it officially says it's available. So you can go online, go on Amazon, wherever you want to purchase your uh, book. If you want a signed copy, you have to get it from the website, leanequitycenter.com. It's right there. There'll be a link. You can grab the uh, autographed copy of the book. I'm really excited for this. By the way, if you are new to the show uh, or if you're just kind of coming across things, by the way, there is a book study that we'll be doing. It's totally free. All you got to do is just show me proof of your purchase and I'll get you signed up. So shoot me an email. I'll get you signed up for the book study starting not this coming Saturday, but next week, Saturday. I believe that is the 23rd. Um, by the way, go ahead and say hello. If you're out there, I see we got some folks that are watching. Always enjoy the opportunity to see who's out there listening to the show. Oh, I looked that way and, and look what I saw. Look, the book, I have it right here in my hand. I know, I know. But listen, I'm very proud of this This. Uh, publication here as it was a lot of work um and so i'm just really excited so grab you a copy and like i said i can get you an autograph now i know that there's some folks that are out there that are like oh but sheldon we bought the you know we got the pre-order and so i can't get an autographed copy well i got you there's this thing uh can you see this oh it's not coming in good but these are called book plates basically what it is is uh i can sign this for you it's kind of like a sticker I'll sign it and I will mail it out to you so you can boom, stick that right on your uh, inside of your book. And uh, there you go. So, again, I appreciate all the support. I am really excited about today's conversation because I am speaking to a good friend. Donna J is here with us today. Listen, we met. Oh, it was probably about two. We were just talking about it. Was it like two or three years ago that we met? Uh, I came to Oklahoma. Let me tell you a quick story, by the way. Uh, thinking about that now this is two and a half years ago i didn't know much about planning and preparation when it comes to travels and i just assumed oh i'm gonna go to oklahoma and all i gotta do is just grab an uber and i will be good to go the next day and i realized when i the day of this is poor planning on my part uh, i realized that there was absolutely no ubers in the entire city uh so i said okay no problem we'll do we'll do a taxi and so I asked the folks at the hotel, I said, I need some help with a taxi cab. And they said, okay, here's the number. I called the number and it just happened to be the day off of this one taxi cab driver of the entire day. So long story short, I was able to ask uh, another person that was staying at the hotel, can you drive me over to Enterprise so I can grab a rental car so that I can drive over to the school and uh, be able to present uh, my keynote at the time. And it was just very interesting. A very important lesson that I learned that day was the importance of planning ahead. Uh, just you can't just be assuming that everything is, is just available for you. Uh, I just figured, well, I live in rural Idaho and we have, we have, you know, Ubers here and we have taxi cabs here. So it shouldn't be a big deal, but I didn't do my proper planning. Definitely a lesson learned. However, I had a really good time with Donna. We did some restorative practice uh, training. We also uh, I also speak uh, spoke uh, to the group as well. It was a great time, really good time, and we have stayed in touch. Me and Donna have stayed in touch, and so for today, I was like, I need you on because we got to talk about our indigenous education. We got to talk about our Native American students, and can you give me four things that we can learn? I know sometimes when we do uh we do you know episodes you'll see stuff like you know things that uh teachers need to do to support our indigenous kids but i wanted to do this on the opposite side i wanted i wanted to do it from uh well, what can we learn from our students as opposed to how we can support our students so that's why i wanted to approach this conversation this way now donna has been an educator for over a decade uh she is a lifelong learner and teacher and a fellow advocate for the voiceless and have supported and has supported her students as well as fellow educators. So without further ado, I am bringing on and would love to introduce you to Donna J. Thank you, Donna. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing today? 
I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you, Sheldon, for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, the pleasure is mine. It's always good to connect with you. Uh, now, of course, like I said earlier, I we've we've been connected for at least two. Let's just call it at least two years. And uh, so I know who you are, and I know what you do, and I'm, I'm really happy for you. Just you've had some some really positive uh, professional changes in your life, and so I would love for you to share a little bit about yourself and what you currently do. Sure. So I um, grew up in a. Uh very traditional household with my grandfather and grandmother. My grandfather was uh, uh, Apache from the Apache tribe of Oklahoma. My grandmother was full blood Comanche from the Comanche nation of Oklahoma. And uh, we grew up in a very uh, loving home filled with our culture and our traditions. Um, we didn't have a lot, but we did have love and, and discipline as well. Um, and I went to school, uh, to high school in a small, small town in Oklahoma. Um, and just a little side note, I had a counselor my senior year. Uh, there are only a few of us that were native in, in the school, but, and we were all related or best friends. Um, but she, whenever we all had our one-on-ones with her, she uh, proceeded to tell me that I shouldn't look at a big university to go to school. Uh, I should just go to a local career tech with my friends and, you know, go get a job, go get a trade job, which there's nothing wrong with trade jobs, but she was deterring me away from going to college. Um, Whether that was because I was, you know, we didn't have the money or because I was native, I'm not going to assume that, but that's the first thing that came through my head. But all of these things happened. And that was one of the driving forces for me to push myself, uh, uh, along with my grandfather uh, telling me that I needed to become a teacher. Um, I had my four kids really young. I have two in the army now and two that are working um, and had them really young and I was getting my bachelor's degree. I started with my associate's degree. I was an Indian education uh, aide at um, our school in Anadarko and my, uh, they, everyone was very support, supportive of me, David Sullivan, Pat Owings, Um, they were all very supportive and pushed me to go farther as well. Um, And I went and got my bachelor's degree in uh, science. I was going to be a science teacher. And, you know, it was um, a lot, a lot, because I had four babies at home working, trying to get a degree. It was a, it was a lot. So, and then moving forward, uh, when I was married at the time, we I went and got my master's degree in education because I just didn't feel like I was ready. And I felt like I was already starting in a deficit being um, a native kiddo who's, you know, my grandmother was an Indian education aide. Um, and that was all, I've on, I only saw our fellow native people in those positions as an aide, or we had a janitor, you know, never a teacher, never, um, a principal, never a superintendent, just, just, you know, in, in those other positions, not in, um, in the classroom. So I worked really hard and, uh, became a teacher at Wachita Valley Head Start. Um, and I loved working there at the Head Start. It was amazing. Miss Hopgood, um, Miss Princetta Pendarvis is probably the best educator I've ever witnessed in my life. She's still teaching. She wow. is, um, I'm not going to say her age, but she is still teaching and she is just amazing with uh, these kiddos. And it's because of representation. She is she is uh, part of that demographic that she's teaching at Head Start um, and went on. I became a teacher. I taught, you know, started off Head Start, went on to second grade. I taught third grade, finished my master's degree, became a reading specialist middle school, high school, Um, I moved up and taught at, uh, we moved from our hometown and moved to Mustang, Oklahoma. And I uh, taught uh, high school. I was a reading specialist at the high school uh, for a few years. And I had the opportunity to be a director of a program um, that I work with now uh, back home called the Native Youth Community Project. And I became a director of that program back in my hometown. And that's how I got you, Sheldon, to come and speak to our, yeah. our group. And um, then I had the opportunity to uh, work 
directly over those grants. So now I am a uh, education specialist at the US, US Department of Education in Washington, DC, um, working with these, uh, all of our, our grants and grantees all across native education country. That is awesome. Congratulations on the promotion. I remember when I saw you posted it, I was like, oh my gosh, good for her. Cause I was like, I knew you were doing some awesome work. I remember having a conversation with you and I was like, you know, tell me about your demographics at the, you know, the, the audience who I'm going to be speaking to and the students population. And, you know, it was really nice to hear the passion in your voice when you were explaining to me your situation as far as what you wanted or expected outcomes from my presentation to be um, and how it, how important it was for it to, to benefit your students. Because you had a, a pretty decent population, a pretty high population of Native students. Is that correct? Right. In Anadarko, uh, there were around 70, 72 percent Native American students. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when I was teaching there, you know, I it was pretty easy to be know everything and be on top of everything and have a good rapport with my parents because I was related to a lot of them and, you know, mm -hmm. knew a lot of them. And so, yeah, we had a have and still have a high population of Native students there. Well, good, good. And, and I, I'd imagine that the work is still continuing down there. So, uh, again, I, I thankful for, for the opportunity, uh, you know, for folks who, who you know, follow the Leading Equity Center. I live in Idaho and, you know, I spent a, quite a few years working on a reservation out here. Uh, and so that was, you know, I've, I've learned a lot uh, about various tribes and Native American um, culture and specifically the culture uh, that's, that's prevalent here. Um, so I wanted to talk to you or have you share with us, the audience, as far as maybe things that we can learn from our indigenous kids. So you got four things that we can learn. So let's, I would love for you to start us off with the first one. Okay. And these are all my personal, you know, thoughts and opinions. And I have to say that. Um, but, you know, growing up um, in a Native American household, being a Native kiddo, a Native student, uh, all through my, from when I was younger to going to college, always being one of the only Native students in, in college. Um, and being one of the only native teachers whenever i was teaching it's uh i uh, used my uh teacher uh qualities i guess and reached out to some uh native students and um miss mckaylin audubo of Anadarko, oklahoma uh she recently graduated from uh, oklahoma state university um she is an amazing young native advocate and uh, she's Wichita and she's Kiowa. Um, I also reached out to Miss uh, Lily Painter, also of Anadarko, Oklahoma, another young, um, and she's going to the University of Oklahoma, but she is a very bright young advocate, um, also Kiowa. But we were talking, and one of the things that I remember that I would have liked, and uh, they agreed, is understanding. I mean, it's simple as understanding that uh, our students would, uh, our native students would like, you know, for educators and others to just be aware of is, um, it's pretty deep as far as, you know, we can ca call it cultural understanding, we can call it cultural responsiveness, but uh, something that Miss uh, McKaylin uh, threw out there is that there's a lot of inaccurate historical um, teachings that are that are being done. And uh, when I was a student at, in college, I remember taking a, a Native American class and, you know, thinking I would learn more or thinking it may have been an easy A. Probably the easy A part was what I was really thinking. <laughs> but uh, I went in and the professor who wasn't Native, um, who proceeded to tell these stories about my tribe in Oklahoma. And uh, we were only on, you know, at the very beginning of it. So I went home and I had all my notes and I was talking to my grandfather and he was like, no, he's not right. He's not right. That's not what happened. Cause our history is oral history. Mm -hmm. It's told, you know, a lot of our, and there's over 500 tribes uh, around the United States and uh, every one of them are different. 
But as far as our tribe goes, we have an oral history um, and it's, it's passed down all the time. And he was just inaccurate on a few things. So I did go up to him and tried to let him know, hey, this was, um, you were wrong on some of these points. Um, and this is why my grandfather, who is, you know, uh, who is Apache and so am I, we, we have our own oral history, we tried to explain everything. Um, he wasn't accepting my uh, knowledge. He wasn't understanding where I was coming from uh, because he only knew what he knew from reading and researching his books. So uh, McKaylin was talking about, you know, there's, um, we have that, uh, when there's this history being taught, there's, um, she stated that there's a, narrative and a cold reality of colonization within mm -hmm. this history and when that happens um it's still hiding who we are or suppressing who we are as a native people think about the pilgrims and indians that we always hear at thanksgiving uh you can go into any classroom and you know probably find during that time there's pilgrims and Indian things going on in that classroom without the actual history being taught. Uh, and sometimes during Halloween, there's offensive costumes for, you know, we still practice our culture. We still practice our customs. We still have our cultural dances and, you know, mm -hmm. our, our powwows and we still dress in our regalia and, you know, we still have our, our jewelry. And um, this is just a reflection of who we are. And when we see that inaccurately descripted or taught, um, it's, it, it's hurtful. I remember being uh, hurt every Thanksgiving when I was younger because wow. um, I always had to be the Indian. When I was little, uh, when they did the Thanksgiving thing, I was, they put the little band and made me wear the feathers. And um, when I was little, I didn't understand it. And I, and I always just wanted that little white, pilgrim hat not anymore but back then when i was little i was <laughs> your kid little right hat. everyone yeah. else yeah yeah they wore the cute little every uh this, these little white um bonnet things and the things that went around their neck and i had a uh the little feather and the uh the the bag the grocery bag that's just cut up the middle and you put your arms little through. potato cloth yes the i had that sack. thing yeah. and so yeah, so I think it's it's understanding and understanding that history is reflective of colonization mm -hmm. um, and what that did and generationally what it's still doing. So just kind of having an understanding that, you know, our indigenous kids uh, have a different experience or, or the colonizational experience um, and how that has shaped maybe their their thoughts on education. Um, is that is that yeah. what you're saying? Okay. Their, their thoughts on education and their thoughts on Native students uh, were more than just, you know, the Pilgrim and Indian yeah. uh, reflection every November, you know, that it's Native American History Month and there's a lot of um, inaccurate teaching uh, over that. And uh, it could be so much more and so much more in depth and so much broader we are more than just pilgrims as McKaylin put it you know we're doctors we're lawyers we're teachers we're inventors uh we are you know a lot of our words that we have in the english language have come from our indigenous tribes mm -hmm. across uh the country and you know it's um we we just want it to be reflective and i think i think if it's um if we continue, like McKaylin said, if we continue to hold um, these type of inaccurate reflections, uh, what is that teaching your Native students? Are you are you holding them down to this one narrative that this is who you are because the history books say it? Mm. Or, you know, and this is what you're teaching all the other kids is this is who you are and only who you are? And I, I saw that as a teacher, um, of, you know, whenever we were, uh, I'm cold natured and I was in my classroom and I love all my students. Uh, there is not one student that I've never loved in my, my life. And my kiddos were great and they were sitting there and I put my sweater on and one of my students said, why are you, why do you got your sweater on? And I was like, I'm cold. He was like, 
I thought you Indians didn't get cold. Uh, so, you know, and he was a sixth grader. So I how do you to respond to say, that? How do you, how, how did you respond to that? So, well, I'm human and I get cold. So <laughs> I'm a human being. Is, yeah. I, I did not know how to respond appropriately. Yeah. Yeah. So I just said, I get cold, buddy. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Now you said, you know, you were young and, and part of this, this first, the first thing that we're, we can learn from our, our indigenous kids is, you know, understanding cultural understanding. What were some of the, do you remember some of the inaccuracies that that professor was mentioning? Cause it just, it just baffles me that you're arguing with someone who does not have any ties or connection to your your ancestry uh and you're arguing with that individual and trying to convince them that they you know hey listen I, i'm bringing some stuff from someone who's like this is my this is my culture and you, you're teaching it wrong like do you remember some of the things he was saying in the in, the, in his lectures um I was only 18 at the time and we won't say how long ago that was, but <laughs> I think uh, from what I remember, I think he was talking about uh, where our uh, tribes, our Apache tribe had um, migrated mm. from and migrated to. And he was saying that they only migrated from this area to this area and uh, you know, a smaller span. And my grandfather, he was like, no, we didn't. We, we migrated all the way across the United States and, mm -hmm. you know, up north and back down. And so we were in a lot of different places and um, it was something as simple as that. And he just wasn't having it saying, well, I read these books and I did this. And um, it was funny because I mentioned to my dad who had, uh, he had his degree from the university of Oklahoma when he got his master's. Um, and I mentioned to him, the professor, and I told him his name and I told him what happened. And he was like, he tried to do the same thing to me when I was writing my dissertation over my dad's dissertation was over his, his people, the Caddo people. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he knew his stories. My dad knew his, his, his people's stories. And the professor was trying to, you know, ding the, the dissertation for every little thing that he thought was wrong because he read it somewhere in a book that one of our people did not write. Yeah, so, I was just about to say, well, who wrote those books? Right. And that's the problem, right? We, 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 how many times do we see these books that are written because someone did some observations or did some research and so they, oh, I know all about this, this community, um, but they're not actually part of the community. So they might spend, you know, a couple hours a day, a day or maybe even a few weeks uh, at a time and doing their observation, but that doesn't tell the whole story. And then they publish these articles or publish these, these books as if this is like, this is the, how the community responds and how the community is, but they really don't have that connection. And I think that's, that's the piece that I, that's missing a lot. And unfortunately that is some of our foundational textbooks that we receive and, you know, in higher education, you got professors teaching um, these subjects and they have absolutely no connection to the, the, the content itself. So I'm glad you're doing the work that you're doing, Donna. So we'll, we'll, we'll put it there. What, what would be the second thing that we can learn from our uh, indigenous kids? So again, reaching out to McKaylin and Lily and, you know, being uh, my personal um, uh, experiences growing up with this is, just um, going, you know, we have understanding and then uh, knowledge, um, just building a deep connection, a deep conversation, those hard conversations that maybe you don't want to have with um, a parent or you don't want to have with somebody who you may have offended. But uh, understanding that, you know, um, healing can come from knowledge. And Lily, our uh, Miss Lily Painter, who's amazing, um, talked about. Uh, the harm reduction aspect of, you know, whenever you are building your own personal knowledge. Um, she talked about when educators disregard uh, Native teachings, uh, as far as when she had educators that disregarded Native teaching and, and history, they were actively contributing to the harm that Native students face every day. Um, and silencing this history is is violence. Those are in Lily's words, and uh, you can tell she's just an amazing young, young lady. But um, 
just understanding that some of the things that maybe you, uh, somebody who is teaching, you know, may have said and, um, or done, or, you know, like the professor that, that said those things to me, um, something, and another thing that happened, and the, and the students that had said those things to me. And uh, when I was in a meeting, I had, um, you know, these uh, uh, people, um, when I was teaching, we were in meetings and somebody said something as simple as let's have a powwow. Um, you know, knowing those things aren't um, really in line with what we should be saying and uh, being able to, having our, our students being able to feel like they can safely say, you know, why did you say that? What is the meaning of that? Why would, you know, why would you teach on something like this? Or, you know, why would uh, you mention that when, you know, cause it, it brings, the, it harms me in this way or it harms me in, in that way. And um, just being aware and understanding and having that knowledge and being able to deeply uh, connect with your students and talk about having that hard conversation about why that was, why that was tough. So when, so what I'm hearing is like, if we're, you know, well-intentioned educators and we say something such as, Hey, let's have a powwow uh, and let's talk about it, but not really understanding how that could be offensive to mm -hmm. our indigenous kids. And then when our kids bring this up to us to be able to be open to listening to that and having that conversation. And, you know, the thing about it is, you know, we, we have the best, you know, I, I just assume I just, I'm just going to say teacher had the best intentions. It wasn't, it wasn't yeah. something that they meant to harm or any of those kind of things, but you need to be open and willing to have those conversations afterwards. Is that what I'm hearing? Right. Right. Having those conversations uh, if you're teaching on um, something in, the, in history, or if you're teaching a book, that that has any type of language in there that may be uh you know uh harming in some way um to being open and understanding and building your own personal knowledge and and why those things are harmful mm -hmm. and harmful for our, our our native students because we're still living the generational um oppressions and we're still you know my grandmother, her and sh my grandmother, who is Caddo, who is still alive, um, she is 86 years young and just a brilliant uh, woman. She got her PhD uh, when she was in her 60s. She taught at a Native American boarding school um, and retired there. And uh, so I'm just saying all of that to, to preface the fact that her brothers um, her uncles and her dad went to a boarding school. They were some of the first who were taken away and uh, had to go to a boarding school. And um, I know she had an uncle that didn't make it. And, uh, you know, I went and I, I actually went and tried to find um, the burial site uh, and his name, but they're not, you know, all, all there. So my... Uh, my family on, on both sides, well, all sides of my Comanche, Apache, and Caddo sides have all lived that type of generational, that, that hurt. It's just a hurt. Yeah. And some of these things that have, um, and, it, and it's passed down, those hurts are passed down. Mm -hmm. And we try and live through it, but um, some things may, may bring that back up. There's always something that will, whether you know it or not, you can feel it. Um, when those things are being said that are harmful. Um, and I learned about, I learned about, so, so I do a training on racial slurs and, um, and, and, and part of that training, I did some research on certain terms and, and, and things, phrases that we say that have historically have ra racist or uh, yeah, racist origins, such as mm -hmm. like you mentioned, let's have a powwow or, you know, someone's gone off the reservation, you know, um, the other, the other one I didn't know about was long time no see that actually has uh, origin from, you know, an, a journalist that was interviewing um, a Native American and 
they kind of had broken English and and it was it was printed a certain way. And so like now to this day, a lot of people will say, oh, long time no see, which we know is is not considered, you know, proper grammar. However, that came from a journalist making fun of of a, a Native American man that was being interviewed. So it's like I and that's like, whoa, I had no idea because I've, I've said that before. Um, and so it's just like I've started kind of changing some of the the things that I've say after doing some research on some of the popular phrases that we talk about all the time that have some sort of racial racialized uh, mm-hmm. connotations or or origin. So I mean, but again, when yeah. we get called out, when we get when when someone mentioned this to us, like, hey, listen, that's actually offensive. Uh, can we have that conversation? We need to be open to have that conversation and kind of see the other person's perspective. Yeah, yeah. The low men on the totem pole is another one. Yep. Uh, yep. And uh, the the song Tin Little Indians, that mm-hmm. little nursery rhyme song, it's, it's based on a horrible, horrible historical thing that actually happened, you know, so... Those type of things. And something else that happens to almost every single Native person I know or related to and me is the little question of what are you? Just mm. what are you? You look like you're this. You look, Are you this? You know, and they're instead of, you know, asking, having another, uh, ask, just asking that in another way. But uh, I don't know any, I, I think I've been asked that question at least. 20 times since I've been, you know, just here. So, just being in DC. Just being here. So, but it happened back home in Oklahoma as well. So it, it's, it's everywhere. But, How do you respond? What, what's your typical go to? Um, I'm just polite and try and teach them and just say, you know, I'm, uh, I'm actually native American. My people are the Apache tribe. I'm a citizen of the Apache tribe of Oklahoma. I'm also Comanche and I'm also Caddo. There's, you know, over 500 tribes in the United States. My dad has always asked that question too. Mm-hmm. Um, and he will mention that he's Caddo and somebody will say, well, I never heard of that. And he's always like, just because you never heard of it doesn't mean that we're not here. Exist. You know, there's over 530 tribes. And so he's a little more um, um, blunt, more blunt than <laughs> I am. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, it's funny because yeah, when you get stuff like those things that hit, hit, you know, microaggressions that happen all the time, like you said, that you get asked all the time, you know, what are you? And and then you know, honestly, and, and it sounds like you're being being very polite. I just know that there's there's going to be some days where you know I'm just not in the mood. I don't feel like giving a teachable moment. It's not my responsibility. Like, what are you? You know, like you know, you just get to those places where it's like I don't even feel like dealing with this right now especially when it happens so much so yeah. good for you for for being nice with it I, I i just i don't know if i if i kept getting it so much you just after a while it's just like no I, i'm not not today not today <laughs> well, hasn't happened yet <laughs> okay okay um so we did two um so what would be the third thing that you that we can learn from our 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 students um well, this is something that, you know, Kaylin, McKaylin and, and uh, Lily and I have talked about as well is um, kind of, I, I don't know how, how to put this, but because uh, I don't want to say what I have written down. That's <laughs> it's uh, just On kind the of, live show. You don't yeah. want to. <laughs> no. no, like, um, you know, there's a lot of, and I don't know, lack of understanding is a, a one of the best ways I can put it, such as that professor mm-hmm. um, or people who, uh, you know, just because you read something about Native somewhere or you watched a movie about it doesn't mean, or you live with a lot of Native people. Oh. I've heard this as well. You know, mm-hmm. I lived there my whole life. I, you know, in that hometown, I understand exactly when you're, you're not, you, you didn't, you, you mm-hmm. lived among us, but you didn't live what we've lived. You didn't see, you know, what we have been through. You didn't cry the tears that we have had to cry because of what we are as our family, as you know, our, our family is bigger than just our, our um, family at home. Our family stretches all over our tribe and other tribes. And we're, you know, we're all 
um, we call each other brother and sister and this is your auntie, that's your uncle, that's your grandma, you know, and we may not be along the same bloodlines mm -hmm. all the time, uh, but we're all there and we collectively understand what each of our people in the past have went through. So I think owning up to that understanding, owning up to that, um, just being more aware, being more aware, I'll say that, uh, being more aware of, you know, what um, our, our kiddos are feeling, our families are feeling, because that's some of the things that I went through, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, will stay with me forever is having to reenact the land run um, when I was little. Mm. So, you know, the Oklahoma land run where Oklahoma was considered in, uh, Indian territory where they pushed all of our, um, a lot of those 37 tribes into Oklahoma. Uh, and some of, a lot of that land was actually the Wichita tribes, their land. A lot of it, they were around, you know, that was a lot of uh, where they had been and the Caddo's were uh, part of that. Um, but I just always remember seeing this Oklahoma Indian territory from when I was really young and seeing one little part in the middle that said unassigned lands. And I thought, how is that unassigned if hmm. all of our people were there first and then all of these tribes are pushed in. So we had to stand. I remember being small and standing around the playground and there's all these flags and we had to run and go get the best spot. And that hmm. was the land run. And then we had, designated people the school designated people to be the sooners and the sooners were the ones who went in before the gunshot and all of that um i still never got the flag i never i wanted i never got that and i just remember uh how that made me feel and i go home and talk to my grandpa about it and he would tell me everything he wouldn't leave anything out mm -hmm. um you know he would tell me everything and all the the hard parts of it um, so I grew up understanding what that land run actually was, but there's a lot of schools that still do that, still do it today. And, uh, no one's owning the fact that that part of colonization, that part of, uh, you know, that part of the oppression or whatever that was at that time, it wasn't that long ago, how it, how it affects our kids today, how it affects our families, how it how it makes us feel because this is all supposed to be, you know, the our our native native lands because we were pushed out of our original homes, and then they say, oh, never mind, we're going to take that back. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's um, it's it's things like that, the glamorizing or the non glamorizing of natives in movies, you know, how we all wear feathers, how we all dress like plain actually they always have the plains indians and we are plains indians my tribe is but um they have every single tribe looking like a plains native american you know with the, that dress and and they all have that same beat in their drum and it, it, that is uh something i think we're coming away from having shows like reservation dogs and having shows like rutherford falls and i just watched that yes. too isn't it amazing watch the whole season yeah it was pretty yes. good it was pretty good go ahead yes but my my son and i love uh the one who lives with me here we love sitting down all my kids love watching it because we're like oh look they have beaded earrings or oh look they have they're actually making fry bread so we see a representation mm. a real representation and they have our native slang in there and you know like just words that aren't thrown around in shows and movies often and and we i i as for me as far as you know me and my kids and my family's concerned it feels real it feels like it almost feels like we made it you know yeah. we're we're finally got our foot in the door um we have representation in in uh here in dc you know um i remember whenever these native leaders were elected um whether i agreed or didn't agree with what, whatever their platform is i still broke down in tears because it felt like that's a part of me there just like when i see these movies that's a part of me my mm -hmm. grandpa my grandma everything that they went through so we could be where we are it it's it just makes it feel real 
makes it feel like we're finally being heard. I've had a lot of folks here on the res tell me, hey, you got to watch Yellowstone. Have you have you had a chance to watch that yet? Um, I watched a part of it, uh, but I'm not as into it as uh, Rutherford Falls and, and Reservation Dogs. I feel like I feel like that has more representation as far as yeah. writers, you know, and and the writing, the directing and all of that. That it's it's more our style. I, I don't know. It's more represent representative. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, out here where I live, um, you know, Yellowstone's right down the street. Well, not down the street, but it's close by. So a lot of the folks, like they actually have people from the reservation that are acting in in Yellowstone and stuff. So a lot of a lot of um folks have been like, yo, you gotta watch Yellowstone. It's it's I think it's pretty good. Like it kind of represents us pretty well. So I was just curious if you had seen it. I did watch Reservation Dogs. Uh, maybe a week or so, and it, I I pretty much binged it all the way through. I was like, I watched the first episode, and then I was like, oh, this is, this is pretty good. I like this, and then I yeah. just kind of kept going and just finished it up. So, yeah, I you know, so basically, what I'm hearing is stereotypes. You know, don't feed into a lot of the stereotypes associated with indigenous um communicate uh, communities, and especially in education, we cannot rely on those type of things because they're often uh, misleading and they're often false and and it's and it doesn't represent all of the various unique tribes that are that are out there um and that's one of the things i i'll admit you know before i started working on the reservation out here i thought you know because i was just taught about native americans just kind of like native american was native american not realizing there's different tribes and different uh ceremonies and uh and 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 powwows are, aren't all done the same way either like all these different things that i've i've learned once i started working in the community but i was totally ignorant to different cultures and communities uh outside of just a general okay native american um and so just kind of not feeding into those stereotypes is 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 important very important yes so you have one more well you want to give us the fourth one I I think we kind of ran into that with the last one. I got ahead of myself, but representation matters. Um, uh, you know, all the the young ladies, Michaela and Lily, were were discussing that. We've we've talked about this before with the other young men that I reached out to. He was um, busy, but his name is uh, Sato Daffron, and and he um, always he's a great young man. He's uh, but we always talked about how you know. I never understood why um, either educators or teachers or, you know, or whoever was trying to teach these, these historical, wanted to teach historical accuracies, um, reach out to your tribes. You have local tribes there. If you have native kiddos near, reach mm -hmm. out to them. Um, that is a part of representation also is putting that, uh, that tribe, that local, that local community, putting their spin on some of your history putting that together just reach out they are willing they are more than willing yeah. to come and help yeah. out at school um going above and beyond and reading books that are written by native authors uh books that are written by native authors i could say that a million times mm -hmm. um and you know like uh having some of these stories in everywhere there these books are everywhere from kindergarten on up just share those those books share those uh uh books with your students and i guarantee you they're going to read it um because it's something that that re is representative of them um bringing in your parents into into your conversations and bringing them into school board conversations bringing them into uh forming a, a, a parent group and making sure your native parents are there to help drive the, you know, the education, uh, help drive your curriculum, help drive the, your, your students forward. Um, uh, I just, I know that if my grandmother was ever in my class, it was sit up straight and make sure I was paying attention. And, uh, you know, I, I remember one time she, she expected the best out of me. I, and I've realized that now back when I was, you know, a high school kid, I didn't understand. But she expected the best, and that was my representative. She, uh, my algebra grade dropped from a 99 to a 94. 
and I got my car taken away. So, you know, it, it went back up. I made sure that it went back up, but she had expected the best out of me. And, you know, if my teacher would have, or somebody who wasn't representative of me, representative of me and my family and my concerns, I may have just let that 94 sit there and may have dropped to a 92, but I've never been in the eighties because that just wouldn't fly at my house, <laughs> but you know, but I, I think being able to pull in those, those people and, and, um, help with, um, help raise these babies, help, help teach them. Yeah. Kids can benefit when they see folks representation in positive light, uh, you know, teach. So even I, I would go beyond that. We, I think we, we could definitely benefit from having more indigenous educators uh, and not just definitely. like you said, your instructional aides, paraprofessionals, janitors and things like that, but also having teachers, principals, administrators, those type of things would be very beneficial for our kids to see it in addition to the content that we're presenting to our students and that that content is written by uh, individuals who have lived experiences uh, and can represent the community that, that they're writing about. So uh, I think these four that you've given have have been totally, you know, right on par. And I'm glad you were able to to uh, put this list together with some of your your, your colleagues as well. Um, do you have a bonus that you wanted to share with us? I do. And this is something that's always weighed heavy on me as a Native student, as a Native educator, as a Native mom, um, is every time I see statistics or see something or go into the school and talk to the teachers or as a parent, um, talking to, uh, you know, other educators as a fellow educator, is um, hearing this word deficit. Mm. Our, our Native students are in a deficit. Our Native students are disengaged. Um, our Native students aren't in a deficit. They are pulling themselves out of being placed in a deficit. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that this is, they were coming from, they're, they're, most of these students, like my, my great grandparents were the first ones into this type of school system, but it was a boarding school system. And, you know, and uh, those were my great grandparents. Uh, my great grandfather and grandmother used to uh, set me on a bed when I was a little bitty and uh, they would babysit us and talk to us in, in Apache um, when I was a little bitty. So, you know, that wasn't that far removed. And there's a lot of uh, issues when it comes to that, because if, you know, we're not a deficit our, our kiddos are not disengaged. They're just not engaged because of what's being taught. Either the, the history is harmful. There's a harmful narrative there of saying, you know, the pilgrims and Indians and, or there's um, some type of um, systemic racial inaccuracy that that's been in the, the history books or been, you know, around such as the land run and, and pilgrims and Indians and things like that. But um, that's one of my biggest things is, is our kids are not in a deficit. We need to quit looking at our kids of being in a deficit and start looking at them uh, and, and helping them and teaching them from where they are. Um, yeah. You know, as assets. And, as assets. Uh, yes. As an, yeah. as an asset. Yeah, I think, you know, and, and sadly, that's that happens very common. I mean, I was special ed director um, on the res. And I mean, I couldn't tell you, I mean, just about like the kids that would come in from the schools from the city. I mean, they're, they're coming in with IEPs and, and, and diagnosis, intellectual disabilities was very common. And I would, you know, sit down, test them and, and talk to them and get to know them and realize it like you are not supposed to be in special ed. You were misdiagnosed. Mm -hmm. uh, you you might have had some some tutoring. You, you could benefit from, from some tutoring, but you don't have a learning disability. Um, but I, I mean, I used to see that all the time. And and it's unfortunately, it is a lot of people in their mindset. Uh, and even these testing are, are, are biased. And so like they get put in place into these programs and or treated as if they're less than or less intelligent. But. And so we put it on the students, but we're not thinking, well, what are we doing that's not connecting with the students? Are we teaching these things that um, 
uh, the students really just can't relate to. And so we're trying to figure out, well, why they're not passing, but well, what can I do on my end as an educator to support them, to help, you know, like you said, meet them where they're at and then get them to where we would like for them to be. So just having an asset approach to me just makes more sense. But unfortunately that happens a lot. People had a deficit mindset. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. you know, I consider you as providing a, a voice in leading equity, Donna. Um, you know, we're going to wrap things up. So folks, if you have any questions, feel free to pop those in. Um, but I'd love for you, Donna, to share uh, your final thoughts. Um, this, uh, you know, is I'm very passionate about our Native American, uh, my traditions, my culture, my heritage. Um, and I, I, th I thank you for letting me come on and share my own personal experience. Uh, thoughts on on this topic and everything a lot everything that I've talked about are things that I've went through as a student as a teacher as a mom um, they're everything everything that I have gone through and uh, may have not necessarily overcome it but I am learning from it and I hope these young these young ladies that I talked to McKaylin and Lily um, they're the real deal leading the way for for our future uh native kiddos coming up behind them and i, I believe that this generation uh that they're in is really going to be some world changers and and um i I'm, that's my job is here is to support them okay now if we got some folks that want to reach out and connect with you what what's the best way to reach you um I have my my personal email is uh, Donna Marie Bustle at gmail.com. And I have a Twitter. I don't I get so busy. I don't check it all the time and I don't even know my handle. I think my handle is uh, at Mrs. Bustle. <laughs> OK, and you have you have Instagram as well. Oh, yeah, I have Instagram. Okay. Um, but I, I don't put a whole lot of, uh, what is okay. my Instagram? Yeah. I was, I was trying to Google your, uh, no, I can't find your Twitter, but um, I'll probably link it in my newsletter for tomorrow, just in case some people want to connect with you. I'll find it Yeah. Uh, and yeah. we'll link it in. Well, Donna, it has truly, truly, truly been a pleasure. I'm really glad that we were able to reconnect again. Um, it's, Good to talk to you. We haven't talked in a while. We, you know, we we talk on social, but just really be able to, you know, spend an hour with you uh, yeah. has been a pleasure. So I I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Sheldon. All right, take care. You too. All right, folks. That will pretty much wrap things up. As always, just a reminder, real quick, real quick. Leading equity. Becoming an Advocate for All Students is currently available. Get your copy. Join our book study, which will start next Saturday. I really enjoyed this conversation as we kind of talk about, you know, I love that Donna brought up, you know, the importance of, you know, don't feed into stereotypes. Really have an opportunity to develop some knowledge and understanding of historical trauma, generational trauma, uh, and, and how that might impact your students. Consider the annual, ev oh, sorry, let me say it again. Consider your annual events and, and traditional practices. Are they going to negatively impact certain groups of people, or especially our indigenous community? Uh, those are some things that we have to consider. Sometimes we always say, you know, we'll say stuff like, oh, you know, well, we've always done this. You know, we do this tradition. We do this event every year. It doesn't make it right. Okay? It doesn't make it right. If you say something, if you do something, again, well-intentioned, and someone addresses it, an indigenous kid addresses this to you and say, hey, listen, saying going off the reservation or saying uh, let's just have a powwow about this or saying something like bottom of the to totem pole, these type of comments are offensive to my people, and here's why. Have you know? Have that conversation. Engage in that conversation. Again, we're, you didn't. We're gonna assume you didn't mean anything by it. So I feel like you should be open to that. 
uh, when no one's perfect, we all make mistakes and those kind of things happen. So just be willing to engage in those conversations. So uh, those are just some of my takeaways from today's conversation. Remember the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But by all means, keep moving. Let's continue to be a voice in leading equity.